I'm a busy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to jump right on in here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Tompkins. I'm the sheriff in Suffolk County uh, in Massachusetts, not to be confused with Suffolk County in New York State. Uh, I've been the sheriff here since 2013. Uh, my, municip my municipality governs uh, Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, and Revere. I have about 850, 55,000 uh, um, residents in our county. It's a vibrant place right now. Boston is, is pretty hot. Um, um, I'm talking about hot insofar as all the work that we get done. We have some great schools here. Uh, we have some great uh, finance institutions, medical institutions. And I, think, I like to think that we have a pretty good law enforcement team here. But that pales in comparison to the folk that you are looking at on your screen tonight uh, for the conversation that we're going to uh, join in when we talk about public trust and law enforcement use of force. But before we get to uh, introducing our panelists, I would like to introduce two of our sponsors. And I'm going to begin with Mr. Ed Naren from AT&T. Please take it away, sir. Well, good evening and thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Edwin Narain and I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for AT&T Florida. And it's my pleasure to be with you at this virtual 45th anniversary Noble Training Conference. AT&T and FirstNet are proud to partner with Noble as you rebuild trust, empower communities and reimagine public safety in the 21st century. Five years ago, we made a $40 billion commitment to build a network that would be exclusive to America's first responders. But last summer, all of us watched with horror as the outrage of a rogue officer abused his authority and murdered a man for the entire world to see. That incident sparked worldwide protests and created an anti-law enforcement backlash that too few people took the time to really dissect. What most people didn't understand was the persons having the toughest time in the face of all the civil unrest in our country was the black law enforcement officer. The black law enforcement officer who all too well understood the pain and frustration behind the anger of those in the streets, but swore an oath to protect and serve people's rights to peacefully protest the changes that needed to be made to improve policing in underserved communities. Who in the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, wore the mask as people tried to create an us versus them mentality when it came to the safety of our neighborhoods, especially those neighborhoods that belong to people of color. But good policing and safe communities are not mutually exclusive. We know the difficulty of your jobs. And over the last year, we've been a solid partner for change, using our legislative resources to lobby for changes to laws that prevent the progress that Noble wants to see. Across the country, we've worked to change everything from the standards used for no-knock warrants in Kentucky to the citizen's arrest law in Georgia. I want you to know today that AT&T stands with you and for you as you seek to ensure equity in the administration of justice and push to see justice in action. Thanks for allowing us to be your partner. We're looking forward to hearing from this panel, and we wish you a great conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And please forgive me for mispronouncing your last name. It won't happen again. So sorry. Uh, next up is Mr. Taylor, who I believe I was able to say that one correctly, uh, from Nietzsche Tech. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, super happy to be here. We miss our noble family. We, we really wish we could be together in person. Uh, this is our seventh virtual training conference. And it's been a phenomenal partnership. And we're really happy to be here. I want to talk just a little bit about what's happened since we joined the Noble Partnership at Niche. Um, we, we are a records management vendor, and we uh, cater to a large agency across the United States. And since partnering with Noble, we've brought an agency such as San Diego County, uh, Kansas City Metro, New York State Police, Suffolk County Police, 
Bear County, Texas, and Wichita, Kansas. So um, our partnership with Noble has been phenomenal. We're very interested in talking to you about your records management needs. As, we, uh, as we're aware, technology has to be part of the conversation to move forward with law mobility, ease of gathering information, and ease of finding information in the system. So those are sort of the things that he specializes in, and um, we're, we're happy to, to talk to you. Travis is, is on here as well. Um, you know us, you've seen us throughout the years. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Now, for the true stars of the show, i uh, just like to say to the panelists that you will each have uh, two minutes uh, for an opening statement, and we will begin with Chief of Police for Charlottesville, Virginia, Dr. Rochelle Brackney. So thank you. Thank you and good evening, um, Noble family. Thank you to our sponsors for your willingness to do the hard work um, to elevate these type of conversations. July 30th of 2021, the Washington Post headlines read, police shootings continue daily despite a pandemic, protests and pushes for police reform. The byline continued since 2015, Police have fatally shot more than 6,400 people, an average of 1,000 individuals a year or three persons a day since they started tracking in 2015. In an attempt to delegitimize community concerns and calls for reform, reimagining policing or imagining a just community, police administrators have suggested that binary such as defund the police um, will result in crime rising. The public knows nothing about the world we live in, so they cannot judge us is often how we hear them respond. In policing, we think about force through the lens of Graham B. Connor, more specifically, those lens that say things are tense, uncertain, rapidly evolving. We must consider now the reasonableness of a particular use of force from the perspective of the reasonable officer on the scene, rather than that with the 2020 hindsight. That lens has been deemed unreasonable by the communities that we serve, unreasonable by communities of color, unreasonable across the nation. That lens has eroded the trust um, of the communities we serve, particularly when our lens have been blurred by a lack of cultural competency in policing, empathy, and ethnocultural empathy. I'm gonna ask this audience, what if we adjusted our view, adjusted our lens and viewed force options through a different optic? If we reframe our language, shift our lens from tense, uncertain or rapidly evolving and not look at Graham V. Connor strictly through a 2020 or a previous lens, is it possible that we determine if it's predictable, it is preventable? And if we identify circumstances in which force is likely to be used, can we prevent the next headlines or bylines? Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next up uh, to the microphone is the Chief of Police for the Hazelcrest Police Department. That would be Chief Mitchell R. Davis. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, hello, Noble. Uh, honored to be here with such a distinguished uh, panel of my colleagues and friends. Uh, trust and use of force in law enforcement kind of go hand in hand, uh, at least the deterioration does. Uh, when, when, when use of force is elevated or, you know, I guess they're proportionate in that that trust seems to be eroded. Uh, here in the state of Illinois, we just uh, implemented a sweeping, some sweeping legislation along the lines of the George Floyd Act. And uh, so one of the main things uh, that we implemented was uh, changes and, and legislation surrounding specifically use of force. Uh, having been on the panel, or not necessarily panel, but the working group that represented law enforcement, uh, I had a unique position. Uh, it was um, myself as the only African American, uh, three different factions of the FOP in the state of Illinois, including the Chicago FOP, um, the Sheriff's Association for the state of Illinois, and our Illinois Chiefs Association, which I represented. And it, it, it just brought me a unique perspective. Uh, I guess one that I knew, but it was more so in your face. Uh, the thing that I always tell folks is that change is going to happen. 
And I tell our colleagues that don't always look like us, the change is going to come. We can either be victims of that change or we can be partners in that change. And uh, given, given the fact that the Illinois uh, Black legislators were going to implement change, even faced with that, uh, a lot of our colleagues just refused to even be a part of that. They didn't want to be affiliated with it at all. And the resulting legislation was pretty, pretty cha challenging to us as a, as a profession. Fortunately, in the trailer bill, we were able to make some changes, uh, but uh, I look forward to sharing some of my experiences as it, as it pertains to the implementation, implementation of this legislation and how often people in our profession don't want to be affiliated with change, especially change that is positive to communities of color. So I, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As I work my way across the country from Virginia going through Illinois, we next land in uh, that great state of Arizona. Next up to the microphone is Police Chief Jeffrey D. Glover. Thank you. Uh, very honored to be here, and uh, and uh, you know, coming from the hot state of Arizona, uh, you know, we uh, we definitely um, you know have a, a lot uh, in terms of things that are changing. Uh, as it relates to just the public uh, trust and as it relates to use of force. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of conversations uh, that have happened uh, in terms of legislation where people are trying to fight uh, some of the changes that are going on uh, out here and blocking some of the cities from making the necessary changes. Uh, we recently in Tempe uh, underwent a public safety task force uh, that provided a lot of uh, collaborative conversations with our community members uh, to be able to come up with recommendations on how we can improve our department and improve our communication and our, the level of trust that's needed to be able to serve our community. And it, it is so interesting to see the, the different dynamics that play out in all of that. We had many activists uh, that came to the table to have conversations with us. Um, that created some some good dialogue in, in terms of just being able to build on relationships and building bridges, which I think is uh, the pathway of being able to to earn back some of that public trust. Um, but the the uh, the big uh, piece in all of this is the the willingness to change. Is that there has to be a willingness for all of us to be able to change and to make sure that that we are collaborating with our community in some of that change. They have to have a seat at the table, and that's one of the the, uh, the important pieces to that is that we do this for the community that we serve. And so, uh, with that, um, you know, I again just honored to be here uh, on this very distinguished panel and uh, taking part in it, and 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 be having the opportunity to uh, to be able to have these conversations with our noble family. Uh, as we know historically, we have we have had these uh, these discussions. Uh, over uh, the years uh, as it relates to change, 21st century policing and the need of, of our community to be able to address these issues, uh, you know, as it relates to just from a, per not only from a personal standpoint, but just the things that we see that are wrong with policing. And so uh, I'm very pleased to be having this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And reaching the Western part of the state, first and foremost, let me say, I love your 49ers, but thank you for letting that coach go to come to New York City. I'm a native of New York. Uh, I'm a Giants fan, but listen, New York, New York is a hell of a town. Next up to the mic is Chief of Police for the San Francisco Police Department, Chief William Scott. Well, thank you all. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of my colleagues on this panel. You know, I think I, I follow everybody on the panel and we all kind of keep up with what each other's doing. And, looking for things that work. And, and I think we are living in a time where I feel personally blessed to be in a leadership position in policing. This, this past year and a half has been incredibly difficult, I think, for all of us. Through COVID, through the civil unrest of 2020, I just lost a friend of mine from my LAPD days uh, just today who died of COVID. It's been, it's been a terribly difficult year. But on the flip side of that, we have so much, I think, wind at our sails, uh, sails wind at our backs in terms of pushing forward the, the reform that is needed in our profession. And that energy really has energized me over the past year and a half to a level uh, that um, I, it, it just, I'm blessed. I, I'm really blessed. I mean, I was hired in San Francisco to, to institute a reform initiative 
Um, we had some struggles when I, when I got here four years, almost five years later, we've um, completed 93% of the US DOJ recommendations. And well, as we open up this discussion, I, I wanna share with you all kind of what we are doing here um, that I know other folks are doing as well, but we've had some success in reducing use of force and reducing officer-involved shootings and in turn re restoring uh, trust that wasn't there before um, and really renewing the faith in policing in our city. We're not there yet. You know, there's never, uh, this, this work never ends, but we've come a long way. And I think we all have stories that we can share with each other about our successes and our failures that will help us move forward. So Stephen, thank you for, and, and Noble for inviting us to be on this panel. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. I'm really, uh, really proud to be among this esteemed panel of chiefs and sheriffs and law enforcement professionals. Thank you, uh, Chief Scott. And please, um, on behalf of Noble, please accept our condolences uh, for the loss of your, your friend and colleague. Thank you. Dr. Brackney, I'd like to begin with you. I struggle with the term defund the police. Uh, it's a term that does not resonate with me and frankly, uh, doesn't make sense to me. But let me ask you this, police reform versus defunding the police. Touch on the difference between the two and what is the best approach to changing policing? So first of all, we tend to think of these ideas as competing priorities, right? We've created this tension between the language of defunding the police and police reform as though that you can only be in one space or the other. Um, as I stated earlier, you're like reform and defunding, they're not necessarily competing priorities and tension. In fact, the binary approach, or if we, we put those in those camps, it's gonna ensure failure um, for the communities. Actually, when I hear defund the police, here's what I hear from the community. I actually hear, I want protection. Right? I want a healthy, thriving community in which I live in. I want justice and morality and policing. What I don't want is this. What I don't want is what you've been giving me. I don't want headlines any longer that read like the Washington Post is what I hear when I hear defunding the police. Black communities are exhausted um, at this point with citing the names of those who have died at the hands of police. They're exhausted with the endless barrage of assaults um, you know, on BIPOC communities and black and brown communities. So the best approach when I think about these things when we're, you know, really want to do it is we need to think about allocating resources that build capacity that allows for the decoupling of police from societal responsibilities. We can no longer afford for policing to be that proverbial catch basin for all of society's um, ills. And we must allocate resources to the community and to policing that allow them both to build capacity to do the work um, in which they were designed and hired to do in those communities. So I'm not as, as troubled by the language of defunding as much as I think um, I would like to think about is how do we refund or reinvest and build capacity to address some of our societal ills and then decouple us from those things we should have never been involved in um, in the first place or criminalizing those things we should have never been involved in in the first place. Chief Glover, let me ask you this question. Here in Boston, um, the whole discussion that we're having uh, here, uh, Dr. Brackney, has a kind of a downward effect on people actually wanting to join policing. They feel like this is not the place for them to be because of the attention or the negative attention that's coming forth from that. Let me ask you, what type of training do you believe is necessary to start the process of change uh, in our policing, uh, Chief Glover? So the type of uh, training that I think is necessary for, for policing is that, first off, we have to all be on the same page. I think that when we look at sort of bringing together sort of a nationalized, sorry for the noise in the background, <laughs> I've got a four-year-old <laughs> and an eight-month-old, so my apologies. But, um, but as, it, as it relates to um, being able to look at different types of, of training, uh, I think that it needs to be standardized. I think that, you, that law enforcement needs to come together and standardize its training methods on a, in a research-based way. 
Uh, one of the things that we've done is that we've really invested heavily in a de-escalation program where we partnered with Arizona State University, um, which is right in our backyard, uh, where we had doctors that came in and really did an assessment on what de-escalation is, what we can actually benefit from, how we can actually uh, really, you know, make an impact with uh, use of force and how we can stop, uh, you know, the, the abusiveness of, of what that is and, and maybe change what that may look like uh, for us. And, I, and I'd say that we ended up coming up with a, uh, with a very uh, different type of model where we call this a sort of like a patrol model where, you know, basically it's, it's about being able to plan exactly what you're doing, assessing it, um, and then taking time, uh, you know, time, distance, space, being able to utilize that, redeploy if you need to go back to the drawing board or reassess, uh, using other resources and your lines of communication. Uh, that is, is, is important. What, what we've seen in the first quarter of implementing that de-escalation uh, model that we, that we have is that we saw a dramatic decrease in the use of force that was utilized uh, in our police department. And so that has had a very profound effect as well as our body worn camera uh, you know, program. We, we have body worn cameras on all of our officers all the way up to the, through the rank of Lieutenant. And there's strict reviews that are in place uh, for accountability. And so through our force review committee, they're going back and they're doing the coaching that's necessary to make sure that they're changing the behavior of the officers when there's issues that arise. So, uh, Chief Davis, uh, um, Dr. Brackney touched on the societal ills. Let me ask you this. Um, do you believe there's a way to reallocate monies from policing and use it for other events and calls that police never should have been responding to in the first place? Well, you know what? Uh, I think that I don't think that there is money. Uh, and uh, the doctor, the good doctor already spoke on it. But uh, defunding happened here, at least here in the state of Illinois, defunding happened in the late uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s, but it was not defunding of the police. It was defunding of social services, those social services that, that dealt with homelessness, substance abuse, mental illness, those things were defunded. And just like most things, as you know, Doc already mentioned that, uh, you know, they kind of get pushed down to law enforcement when there's nobody else to take care of it, it gets thrown on us. Well, you know, what happened as a result of that? We'd send our people to 40 hour CIT training, you know, but, uh, you know, we did the best that we could to deal with those things, but the money they saved by defunding those services was not given to us. Uh, they gave us the duties, but they didn't give us the, fin the financial savings that they uh, incurred as a result of it. And now that they want to take these things away from us, which we're OK with, they now want to take money away from us that was never given to us. So, you know, I talk about my town, you know, I, I, you take money from me. I, I'm not a I'm not a, a large city. I'm not a uh, we don't have a lot of money. So, you know, I got squad cars that that have 150,000 miles on them, you know, and, and you take money from me, you're going to hurt the citizens of Hazelcrest because we weren't given that money. Uh, but you want to reallocate the services. So um, I do not think that there's money there that needs to that, because it was never given to us. But I, I am as absolute belief that we need to make sure that we have the true professionals. We got to figure out how the true professionals can be a part of dealing with these ills that we have in our communities and giving them equitable service, the same service in, in small communities that they are in affluent communities, no matter what the, the, the makeup is. So those are the things that we have to figure out and we got to figure out how to fund those things without hurting police departments. You know, I'm going to go to you, uh, uh, Chief Scott, and then I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Brackney. And I want to ask you about the term public trust which is widely used, but who determines the scope of public trust? Well, I believe the public de determines that scope. I mean, we are, sometimes I think we were guilty of getting caught up in telling the public what they want and or telling the public how they should feel. And, and that's a mistake. You know, we, we serve the people and whether or not, um, regardless of the scope of the audience, the demographics of the audience or the, the communities that we serve, it really is up to the public to determine what level of trust they have in their local uh, policing agencies. And, and we can't define that. We can work to improve it. And we always should be working to improve it, but we can't define that for members of the public. Um, some communities are, it's a lot harder to, to get public trust to begin with 
and maintain it than others because of historical uh, issues, some of which Dr. Gaffney, Brackney, I'm sorry, has discussed and, and Chief Davis and, and it, really we all probably have lived this. I mean, we're all African-American and there is those, those historical um, issues that policing has, has, has imposed upon the African-American community in this country for generations. And that doesn't go away uh, quickly and easily. So really, we, we can't define that. What we can do is understand it and work toward getting better to do the things that we need to do to make sure that we are able to have a chance to have the public, regardless of how you find, define it, trust us. And it, it, it really goes to what we do. Not, not so much what we say, but what we do. And we, we talk about use of force and reducing officer-involved shootings and protecting the public constitutionally and things that we are, are supposed to be by nature um, good at that sometimes we fail at. And we have to be better. We're human. Every agency is made up of human beings. We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have mistakes and we're gonna have sometimes malfeasance, but how we react to it, how we respond to it, those are really the things that are important when it comes to getting public trust and maintaining public trust. So I, I just think to ask, answer your question and go back to what I said earlier, it's not up to us to define it, it's up to the public. Well, you know, Dr. Brackney, picking up on that, if you look at community policing, and what Chief Scott just talked about, about the definition and who defines public trust. If you look in the community policing where police are actually walking and working in those communities, does that give law enforcement uh, the opportunity to work on that definition of what public trust is by the way they comport themselves? So what's interesting is the lens in which I was, well, I was thinking about it when Chief Scott was just responding, saying that it's the community who actually defines it. But what, what's so interesting is, is we are the influencers of their definition of, of just that, right? So in the not too distant past, policing um, law enforcement was naturally granted without any second thoughts, the ideas that they were trusted in the community. They were trusted um, as part of these foundational institutions of Western civilization. So no one ever thought about it as public trust. And what was interesting, there was an earlier panel discussion um, and I jacked their notes on this, so I, they're gonna have to be okay with me. It was the uh, 21st century policing for community success through the lens of the polarities of democracy, shout out to them. But what they said is what office, what we reward the officers will do. Well, society is the same way. What society rewards is what the officers will do and that influences public trust. Mm -hmm. So then you start moving that into the concept of of community policing. So I'm gonna be really controversial here. You know, community policing is no more than a tagline and we need to walk back it. Um, community policing has been romanticized just like officers walking the beat has been romanticized. This is a very different community that we operate in today than we did possibly 50 years ago. What works regardless of the spin we put on all of this is relational policing. How do we relate to our communities? How do we create relationships within the communities? And thereby we build trust or legitimacy, right? Authentic legitimacy in each of our um, communities. So um, I for one do not believe that um, we that the, it's just solely on the public to define it. I think this is a relationship that is very dynamic. It is very fluid. Um, it is not as stagnant as it was previously when we just had those um, rights and privileges bestowed on us because we were in a modernized Western civilization. So just my thoughts on that. Uh, Chief Davis, uh, a question uh, from Dr. Charles that kind of factors into this conversation about the public trust. And, and I'm gonna attach the, the utilization of dollars or limited dollars. And, and what she asked here is um, uh, the, it, that there should be more of an investment in prevention and less than, less than equipment and enforcement measures. And the reason I bring that up, that question up is here in Boston, there is this concerted conversation about policing dollars and the reprioritization of those dollars. In fact, one of the, uh, the uh, mayor oil candidates that I mentioned earlier would like to take $50 million away from the police budget to reallocate that 
more towards community, uh, community organizations, and casework. How does the utilization of dollars and equipment factor into the conversation of public trust, sir? Well, there's some fundamental things from a, a budgetary standpoint that we just have to have for operational purposes. But uh, as doctor, as the doctor just said, and I'm in total agreement with her that it's all about relationships. You know, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. We've heard that before. And we have to, so it doesn't cost any money to develop relationships and to, to it's with the community. So from a leadership standpoint, it's up to leaders in law enforcement to instill in the people that are in their organization that we're gonna develop relationships with those folks. And it starts with the hiring process. I don't, and I mentioned it earlier on one of the panels that I was talking on is that how do we hire people? I don't need the, the person that can take a punch and they can go out there and fight three people by themselves. I don't need that person. That, that was the, the, those were the things that people looked for before, but now we got to reimagine things. We got to reevaluate and have a paradigm shift. And in that paradigm shift for me, I need people, I can teach you how to defend yourself and protect yourself and others. I can teach you how to do that. I can't teach you how to be empathetic. That's the most fundamental thing. If you can't care about the people that you're, that you're policing and that you're dealing with, if you can't care and empathize with them, that's not something I can teach you and I don't need you. But beyond that, I need people who can think. I need people who can think and who can problem solve. If I could have those three characteristics, though, that's the way that we develop relationship because now you have a, a group of people on your department that truly care or want to know how to care about the people that they serve every day. And in doing so, they're gonna, they're gonna use that ability to think and, and to problem solve in order to make things better in the community. So we have to start attracting those individuals and that has to start from the top. And we have to make it so that when they come into our organizations, it's comfortable for them to operate in that certain space. And so that's gonna, you know, so it's multifaceted, but that's one key thing that we have to do. And, and that doesn't really cost money. That's a, a philosophy change. And in changing philosophy, that money that we're, you know, talk about reinvesting, uh, Dr. Charles talked about reinvesting in, in, in relationships and, and develop with the community. That's how those things are gonna grow. And that's how we can, talk to our administrators and those folks who want to take money away from our, us to show them that, hey, we're doing the best that we can with what we got and look at what we're producing. These are the outcomes. We're able to show measurable outcomes and in, in, in those relationships. Interesting that you just say that in my department three years ago, we probably have two to three academies, uh, cadet academies populated about 40, 25 to 40 people in each academy. And what I wanted to do and what I have done, because 65% of my population here is black or brown, we made a concerted effort to make sure that 50% of each academy was black or brown, and it was black or brown that lived in the communities here, not far away, not in Maine, not in New Hampshire, but here in Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, East Boston, for this reason. If an officer wants to get a little jiggy with an inmate while they're inside, well, you might bump into this guy or this lady in the supermarket on the outside, then what? You know, and so we wanted to make sure that our, our labor force was reflected of, reflective of our inmate population. And I agree with you. But the thing that we say is that we no longer need GI Joe and GI Jane. We need and recruit cadets that really have a sociology, psychology, uh, health background, because they need to understand the psyche and work with the psyche of the individuals that we have governance over. Because our thing is, do we want people to leave here uh, better than when they arrived or worse? And so our contention is that we need to work with them and understand them and listen to them, but not just them, but to work with their families. We had to bring the family unit in and get them engaged so that it would just be a better outcome. And, you know, look, recidivism here in Massachusetts is 46 percent and maybe high in your respective areas. But we're chipping away at that a little bit. You know, uh, uh, Chief Glover, let me ask you this. this is a final question on this public trust. What does police reform look like? from your perspective, sir? Uh, so from my perspective, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's reform, it comes in the shape of what the community uh, is calling for and what they want. And it's a collaboration. You have to be able to collaborate with your community to understand exactly what their expectations are. It's based off of the expectations and the passion for service that we have to be able to give them what it is that they want and what it is that they need. Um, and and, it, and it, that comes through dialogue. We have to be able to have 
good conversations with our community to understand where it is that we should be. And that is sort of the measuring stick. And it's it's sort of our own, uh, I guess, re report card, you know, in, in a sense is that if we if you measure that out and to get into um, something that Dr. Brackney said, because I love the, the aspect of really relationship based policing, you have to build relationships with the community and to understand exactly where it is that they're coming from, because we no longer get the benefit of the doubt. Uh, that 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 time has passed. We're in a different time now, uh, and and so, you know, there's a, there's the that resiliency that I think that if I could be candid, I, I think there's a lack of resiliency uh, among some of our counterparts. I mean, we've experienced is this as Black people, and I think that in policing now is that we are seeing a lot of people that are being painted in a broad brushstroke that they're not used to, and, and this hurts but they're, they're experiencing what we've been experiencing our entire lives. And so how do we get them to that point where they keep that passion, where they keep that, 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 that empathy, where they can go out and really um, police and, and actually be a part of that community and, and understand that. And I think it's going to take a lot of educating of our people to make them, you know, to make sure that they are understanding that this is about service and just getting back to our purpose. That's the, I think that's, that's the key piece. Dr. Brackney, uh, the pandemic opened many eyes to many um, deficiencies in the way um, we do our healthcare, the way we do our criminal justice, our education, uh, employment, housing, so on and so forth. My question to you is, and, and unbelievably, I've had conversations with white colleagues and others that, I mean, they came across honestly believing that we were all being treated the same, unbelievably. Unbelievably, going to your, your comment, Chief Glover, unbelievably. How do we now, on the other side, hopefully, of COVID, make sure that people's eyes remain open and see that we can no longer have those inequities going across the spectrum, ma'am? So, so it's actually interesting. Earlier today, I was involved in a another panel discussion in which one of the um, panelists talked about this idea of double marginality, right? That when you're a black person who wears a blue uniform, you're already being marginalized in so many different ways. And so I just added to him and said, well, I'll take the triple marginality as a multi-ethnic black woman and add the quadruple marginality because I live below the Mason Dixon line at this point as a northerner. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which we need to, to think about keeping our eyes open. And there's something I always say, as black people, we've never had the luxury of slumbering. We have always had to be woke long before the category of wokeness was ever applied to any um, single one of us. So how do we keep that together, right? How do we keep people in the moment and driven by the movement? So there's two ways we have to think about this. One is, yes, we're always trying to get our numbers up, right? And what does that look like? And it's, it's laudable that we want 50% of the um, population that is being hired to look like the communities or reflective of the communities, right? But that's passive representation. With that passive representation, particularly at leadership, there's an assumption though, that it will lead to this more active representation through policies and practices and the implementation of policies and practices. And when we do do that, we have to think about um, what are not only our hiring practices look like, but our curriculum. Like, do we really embed our curriculum through a lens of empathy? Um, you know, ethnographical or ethnocultural empathy now tells us we need to see people, not only see and accept them for whom they are, right? So it's not enough to just say, I see folks and I'm no longer colorblind. We have to accept that these are exactly how the way this society has operated. Mm -hmm. And we can now no longer allow society to, to, or at least my counterparts, to wait out the movement. Because that's typically what we do. We just wait out the next movement, right? Cops are great at that. They're like, okay, the next defund will come, the next restrictions, DOJ will look at us a little differently. So we have to really just think more about not allowing um, this moment 
to pass. I tell people all the time, we are in a movement. This is not the time to be still. Um, and then we also have to think about a more nuanced understanding of our communities. We can no longer afford to just do check boxes. Let's say we've had the implicit bias training, the explicit bias training, the cultural competency, cultural diversity, cultural professionalism, you name it, we've had it, they've rebranded it and then shipped it back out to us again. We really have to think about the policies and practices that benefit a diverse population, both internally and externally, um, and ensure that we implement them and carry them out um, as part of our everyday duties and responsibilities. Chief Davis, uh, has your state allowed police leaders to partake in the reshaping of public policy and procedures as they pertain to reform? Wow, that will, you threw me a, a, a slow high one there. So, uh, <laughs> so as I mentioned uh, at the onset, I, I was involved in the uh, development of the legislation that is currently in place in the state of Illinois. And sure. just to kind of give you context as to how, how it transpired, that there was a there's a coalition that represented that represented law enforcement, and it, it was about a criminal justice reform bill. That coalition, as I mentioned before, is three different factions of the FOP, the state FOP, the state police FOP, and the city of Chicago FOP, the Sheriff's Association, and the Illinois Chiefs Association. I uh, was a representative in the Illinois Chiefs, being the only African American in the room. And so the, the Black Legislative Caucus came to law enforcement and asked us, we need your input so that we can properly do this. We wanna work with you in order to bring about this productive criminal justice reform. Now, the meetings before the meetings that we had uh, with my colleagues, uh, all they talked about was, we don't want anything to do with criminal justice reform. We're not giving them any ideas. We're not gonna tell them anything. And as a coalition, that's what we're gonna do. And I told them that, they are not asking our permission, they're asking for our input. So they're going to do something. So we, once again, we can either be part of it or we can be victim of it. Well, we don't wanna be affiliated with that. So we're not gonna say anything. So this went on for months and months and months. And so finally the legislators, these black legislators brought forth their own uh, verbiage and it was not favorable at all for law enforcement. And now they're screaming in the media. I mean, literally attacking the black legislators, that they never came to law enforcement, they never asked for our input, you know, don't vote for these guys, you know, any white people that, that sided with them, you're going to get voted out. I mean, it was, it was horrible. And when time came for the signing of the bill into law, they asked me to come and sit down. Well, I couldn't sit down in my capacity of Illinois chiefs because they were part of the coalition. So I sat down in representing Noble. And after I spoke at the, at the signing uh, that the governor signed it into law, I was attacked by colleagues all over the state of Illinois uh, because I was the only law enforcement voice that was speaking out and which I have no problem with, but that, that, that whole thing that they're trying to portray that they, these black legislators never came to them and that they just pushed this forward, this is terrible law, it should never be, able, that's the, what they were selling to the public and the public not having been in those meetings didn't know what was going on. So that's what's being sold out there. And when it came to the trailer bill, so we did a trailer bill. Well, now they want to talk. And now, and, and, and once again, the meetings before the meetings, they want to come be the saviors. Well, well, we'll give them some input. And now we can say that, hey, we corrected this wrong that these black legislators put out there. So that's the thing that happens. That's, that's what happens behind the scenes. And that's why it's so important that not only that we're in the room, but that we have people in the room who are not scared to say something. Cause I could be sitting in the room and just say, man, that's jacked up. That's messed up what they did and not say a single thing. And uh, I, I guess you can put it this way. That coalition no longer existed once I became president. I was vice president when it started. And when I became president and because I'm so vocal and I pushed back and I didn't allow them to just do what they were accustomed to doing. They know they're not at this point, they no longer affiliate with the Illinois Chiefs Association because I'm the president now, which I'm good with because I don't want to be affiliated with them anyway. So um, you probably didn't ask for all that, but that's kind of uh, no, that's all good. how it happened here in the state of Illinois. You know, Chief Scott, we, we have some difficulties here with our legislators also uh, because they have jurisdiction over my budget. Also, they would like to influence the way that we do the work that we do. Um, good or bad, uh, I don't report to the mayor or the governor. So I can essentially, as long as I'm not burning the place down, 
do what I want to do uh, to help people that are in my care and custody. But once again, they do have control of my dollars. So sometimes you have to tiptoe around what you're trying to get done. How are you working with your legislators or how are your legislators working with you out there in Frisco? And then I'll go to you with the same question, uh, Chief Glover. Well, we, we have several layers that we have to navigate through. First of all, we have a police commission. It's a seven, seven member panel that really oversees the policy making of our, our police department. And some of them are, are appointed by our mayor and some of them are appointed by a board of supervisors. So there's some dynamics there that we have to work through. Um, then secondly, we have a board of supervisors here locally that runs our, our county uh, budget. San Francisco is a city in the county. Uh, we are the only city in the county, but a board of supervisors really has to approve all of our, our budgets, all the city department. So we have to navigate that. And then there's our state. One of the things that um, I found to be both professionally rewarding and successful in terms of influencing policing in our state is we, we don't want to wait to be told. We don't want to wait to be forced to change. And for us, for instance, our use of force policy, you know, we had some, some issues several years ago um, and we changed our use of force policies. Pretty drastic changes for the time. We outlawed uh, carotid holes, choke holes. We outlawed shooting and moving vehicles. We uh, put in our policy, um, de-escalation language in our policy, sanctity of life language that had not been there before. But the reason I bring that up is as a result, Two things happened since then. That happened in 2016. Um, early 2017, we started to implement it, and we've seen our use of force reduced by almost 60%. We've seen our officer involved shootings significantly reduced. As a result of that, it started to get attention. And when our state laws changed this past year, past two years actually, a lot of what is in the San Francisco Police Department policy was modeled by our state legislature. And so in that respect, we kind of led, helped lead the way with, with changes. And as I said earlier, it's not what we say, it's what we do. And we have to be willing to do these things as I can attest to what Chief Davis was saying. It's not always popular. People don't necessarily embrace change all the time in this profession, but we have to lead the way and not be forced to change. Um, we need to create our own destiny as much as we can do that. How that works with our budget, though, is I find that when we do things like that and we're successful, we have a little bit easier time getting some of the funding that we need to implement that change. So they really go hand in hand. It doesn't always work out in our favor. But when we're able to successfully implement policies that make sense, that actually go toward reform, I find we have a much easier time. Uh, uh, Dr. Brackney, I'm going to go to uh, Chief Glover with that same question, but when I come to you, um, Chief Scott just brought up the, the whole issue about use of force, and I would love to hear what you think about that, but uh, to you, Chief Glover, uh, on the, the dynamic between dealing with your elected officials and what you have to get to get your, your department the resources that they need to do the job effectively, how has that worked out there for you, sir? Well, definitely similar to, uh, to what Chief Scott's saying and, and uh, Chief Davis is that, you know, in working with our state legislators, uh, there's a lot of things that you have to get in front of because, you, you know, you don't want to be forced uh, to into a situation or into un, unfunded mandates, uh, as we call it, you know, that 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 becomes problematic for us. And so, you know, in trying to be uh, ahead of the game, uh, you know, some of the things that, that we've done Quite frankly, you know, recently we had uh, officer involved shooting protocols being looked at and there was uh, a mandate that was going to come down through legislation talking about how we had to come up with a, a way of being able to independently um, uh, basically, uh, you know, conduct those investigations. And so one of the things that we countered back with is that we came together, you know, as chiefs uh, within the Metro Valley to discuss, have a discussion about it and to really lobby with the state legislators and, and, dis and discuss with them what this actually does. Because quite honestly, we could go out and, and, and cover each other's officer involved shootings, but really does that actually get to the point in terms of transparency that they really want? That's not what the public wants. 
they don't want officers investigating officers really. I mean, we've heard that before. Um, and it becomes an unfunded mandate that becomes problematic because we were st we're still going to get crucified for a bad shooting. Uh, we would rather have an independent body that's created within the state to be able to actually uh, investigate those officer involved shootings. And so that was one of the things that we lobby for. And uh, we've been very successful in, in getting the legislators' attention and being able to back away from the uh, officer-involved shooting protocols that they initially uh, put out there, uh, you know, to, to vote. And so they they rescinded that, and they actually did listen to us because we came together as a collective body to to have those discussions because it was. It was a. It was definitely um, going to be problematic because there was not going to be resolution. There was. It was only going to end up creating more issues re related to public trust and transparency in cops, just investigating cops. So it, it wasn't going to actually resolve the issue. It was going to do, to basically cause this to to end up being a situation where the matters were going to get worse, uh, you know, depending on what jurisdiction and who's doing the investigation. And, you know, whether you have the sheriff's department come in and take that over or not, it, it was it was really going to be a messy situation. Dr. Brackney, many agencies have different uses of force. Should there be a comprehensive national standard for all law enforcement agencies uh, dealing with use of force, ma'am? So, so thank you for that. This is one of my favorite subjects and one of my favorite uh, topics um, in general. But if we're talking about just really quickly about our budgets and what's so important about budgets, right? I think we often skirt around what really informs your budget. The community needs to decide what policing services it wants, and then we need to tell them how much it costs to have that service. So if there are certain services we don't want in the community, the community doesn't want us involved in, then we should say that and then say, you know what, I need this many officers to deliver the type of services that you want me to deliver. But when we shift to that, because often budgets are connected to because of these incidents of force, people are saying, hey, just, you know, defund the police. We don't want them um, in our communities. I would rather have cameras and technologies and I can survive that encounter um, than possibly surviving um, a police encounter. So not only should we have standards um, about that, um, about use of force, I believe in national standards. I believe in national reporting standards. What's so interesting um, about it is in the policing community is there's only typically one place where you can get certified as a firearms instructor, and that's the NRA, right? So you have to belong to the NRA to get your firearm certifications, and that's a national um, um, you know, repository for your certifications, et cetera. But we don't want a national use of force um, database. And typically because we're worried about scrutiny, um, we should not only have national databases and stand our standards, we should have national databases. The FBI started one in 2019 for the first time to collect database or to collect use of force data. And what they interestingly said, um, that there was only about 5,000 agencies that actually participated by putting information into that database. And then nationally, they also put down something that said that there was not um, mandatory, that it was strongly encouraged involuntarily. Well, you can't strongly encourage any mandate. Um, you just either have to do it or not do it. And how do we do this in a way that allows for the community to really um, look at our policies? One, I post every one of our policies online. We still have resistance to people posting their policies online. Put your, um, and we don't call it use of force. Again, coming out of Pittsburgh, we started really back in 1998 calling it response to resistance. Why? Because it makes you reframe the way you look at the encounter, right? If you say I'm going to use force, you're just thinking about force options. If you say I'm responding to resistance, it makes you psychologically think about what is in front of you and how you might need to respond to that. Mm -hmm. Something else controversial. I put every use of force response to resistance incident on my website. And I don't just mean like everyone who says, oh, we use, you know, we had two deadly encounters or we used our ass. I put a scenario. Here's the scenario of the force 
This is the race and gender of the officer involved, the race and gender of the subject involved, the highest level of force that was involved. Um, and we post that on our website so that the community can really look at the type of encounters that we have. And it was so effective just reframing our language and doing those kinds of things that last summer, when everyone else was referring to the rallies and the, and the marches and the demonstrations after the murder of George Floyd, I never used the words like civil unrest. I didn't use protest. We've reframed the language that said, hey, listen, we have communities who are marching to demand accountability from their government, and we are the first face of that government. We are absolutely going to allow them to do that. And we're going to support and facilitate it. It then changes even the way that you think about encountering, as I said earlier, if we can predict when we can use force or should be using force or may have used force, then we could prevent the likelihood of using force in the long run. So I say go for a database, go for standards. Um, USC has a Lewis registry on officers that we, you know is voluntary. We're one of the agencies that, that voluntarily participate in that, the FBI ones. You know, just be, if you want to be transparent, I think uh, Chief Davis said it, it's not what we say, it's what we do. Um, when we do all these special sessions, Justice and Joy Sport and Policing Act, I didn't have to change a single thing. We've been doing it since I arrived here in 2018. We've already invested and then we, you know, the community is now responding. It hasn't been easy, but they are responding um, and will give us some grace that they may not have given us, you know, four years ago. So I'm going to go around the horn with this question, but I'm going to start with you, Dr. Brackney. A few moments ago, Chief Davis said that I threw him a slow, high pitch, okay? I'm going to come straight down the middle now. I'm coming straight down the middle. And I want to ask you about all of the calls to eliminate qualified immunity. What changes should be made to address police accountability? So that's interesting. Um... I don't play baseball, but okay, I'll take this straight down there. All right, throw it at me first. Um, I know you slow rolled it to him. That's all right. Um, so, you know, when we, when I was thinking about even the concept of qualified immunity and we were talking about them back and forth, right? Um, officers in general will want every right and every privilege and every benefit and every due process afforded to them. They'll have their grievance officers in the rooms with you. They'll have their police benevolent association attorneys in the room with you. Um, they are holding up the Bill of Rights. You know, they've got the Constitution in the other hand, and they're always talking about their their rights and the framework under which they they want protections. Very seldom do they think about the community's protections and due processes and the rights that are afforded to them in which society has said, we will allow you to police us if you do this in a certain way. Um, qualified immunity is about protecting you from civil liability, mm -hmm. civil liability. We're very seldom if ever going to be prosecuted. We all know this criminally. The few headlines that we get here and there cannot atone for or, or rectify those sins. But here's the thing with civil liability. If you eliminate qualified immunity, which not only just applies to police officers, it applies to politicians, it applies to government agents who don't want to come out and tell you that they don't want to get rid of those protections because then it makes them liable as well. So most officers are going to be indemnified by their agency anyway around this civil liability um, to start with, even in the federal cases. But if you do away with qualified immunity, you got any sponsors of Noble who are in the insurance business, Offer malpractice, just like you would for a doctor. Give me malpractice insurance. I would take that insurance and say, hey, I'm hedging my bets in case something ever happens, just like we do with our cars uh, that doctors have with malpractice. Give us that opportunity and create your own little niche um, and make a fortune at the exact same time. So um, I want some percentages if any of you are on here are doing insurance. <laughs> Chief Glover. Um a little bit ago, um, Senator Tim Scott and Senator Cory Booker were talking about qualified immunity and something came up in these discussions and forgive me, I don't have the exact uh, wording and verbiage of this, but they were talking about a change wherein if an officer committed whatever the offense was, that the officer does not get charged, uh, Dr. Brackney, but that officer's department could possibly get charged or that municipality 
I, I, it, 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 it stuns me that they could even utter those words because there are a lot of small departments that if that were to uh, come to fruition, would be out of business. Um, speak to that, sir, about changing that, that, that what they're saying and, and any thoughts on how uh, qualified immunity could be tweaked for the better, if that's possible. Well, I think you just basically stated it. I mean, if you were to, to do something of that nature, you would end up bankrupting several uh, small police departments, with, which would be problematic for their communities, especially for those that are already disproportionately um, you know, uh, affected by policing in the first place. You're going to have those communities that really sorely need law enforcement in place that are now going to uh, you know, have departments that are gonna be non-existent. And then what kind of level of service are going to, is going to be provided then at that point? Cause who comes in and takes over that service? Um, and so you, that becomes pro problematic as we're seeing right now in terms of uh, qualified immunity and for those states that have actually uh, eliminated it is that, you know, just as Dr. Brackney has indicated, you know, you go out and you go get you some somewhat similar to malpractice insurance for a doctor and you'd have to go and get insured. But now you also have uh, the excess uh, insurance carriers that don't want to ensure law enforcement. And if you have civil uh, litigation that's going on or something that is, that is uh, you know, you're being, your department is being sued, you have some insurance carriers now that, uh, that are saying, hey, you need to settle that right away because we don't wanna have to pay that, that out. And if you don't, we're going to drop you. And so those are, that's the harsh reality that we're looking at because of some of the bad actors that we have seen in law enforcement over the past several years uh, that is where it's gotten to that point where even if you if when you eliminate it uh, if it is eliminated then you are, you're going to have problems with insurance carriers wanting to cover uh, the payout on anything and so i think that that that's that's going to be that that's going to be a potential issue uh, altogether uh chief scott let's go to that intersection of um qualified immunity and the utilization of body cameras, okay, to actually um, uh, chronicle whatever that event was. Talk to us about that intersection and the use of uh, uh, body cam cameras and then the releasing of that footage uh, to show that this officer did or did not do the right thing. What's your thought on that, sir? Um, let, let me start with the, the second question about the releasing of the footage. I, I think that, um, we have to release footage. I know there are some states, but let me, let me back up even a step further. A every state is different. I mean, you know, California is different from Illinois, it's different from Arizona, it's different from, from Virginia, and we all have different state laws. Some states, uh, they're prohibited by law to release body-worn camera footage. We saw that issue come up uh, just recently. In our state, fortunately, we are, we are not prohibited. So in, in our, our department, we consistently release body-worn camera footage, particularly for officer-involved shootings. And we do it within 10 days of the shooting. So we've been consistent on that. And our policy is really, really clear about uh, there's three instances when we won't release it. Uh, first being when it's against the law or uh, when there's privacy concerns, such as a juvenile or some, some something that would invade a person's privacy to the point that it becomes either unreasonable or against the law. And the third thing is if it puts either the public or involved officers or any officers for that matter in jeopardy. And that has to be vetted. It, we, you know, we just can't say, you know, the public doesn't like this, we're, we're in jeopardy. So it has to be a legitimate concern. What that does is it gives us consistency. Um, I've been here for almost five years and uh, there's been only one case. Fortunately, we hadn't had a whole lot of officer involved shootings, but there's been only one case where we, we didn't release it and that involved you know, some of the issues that I, that I brought up. The reason I bring that up is we have now uh, many agencies in this country that are fully equipped with body worn video cameras on its officers. And when the public doesn't or isn't allowed to see the, that footage, it, it creates all kinds of problems. Number one, we, talk, we started this conversation about trust it breaches trust. What do you What do you have to hide? Uh, people, uh, we're not transparent, and it just causes problems all the way around. So my take on that is, yes, we should release them. When it goes to court and uh, actual cases, whether it be civil or or criminal, they play a tremendous role in court cases. The days are gone. I started in policing. My career started in 1989. 
Uh, testimony then was a lot different than it is now, at least, you know, in my neck of the woods, because you could go on the stand and you, you pretty much would trust it in your word. That day is long gone. At least it is here in California. And so when you don't have a videotape to corroborate what you're saying, you, you, you are, uh, you have a chance of not being believed just because of the, you know, the way things are. So I think we're, we need to protect our own interests and be smart about it as a profession. We should release the, the footage. Uh, we definitely have to release it for court if it's evidentiary. And when it comes to these civil cases, the same, the same principles apply. I mean, these cases are oftentimes are made or broken by video. We have to remember that video is only one piece of evidence. It does not tell the whole story in all occasions. And that can be very dangerous because oftentimes the dynamic for us is videos go out, they go, they, they go viral, a narrative gets out there. And despite whether that narrative is accurate, true, or, or, or in between, we have to live with it. It influences juries, it influences public opinions on policing, um, and it makes our job quite complicated. So we really have to put a lot of time and energy into understanding where we are right now with video. And uh, I think it's good. Our policies are clear here in San Francisco. All of our officers that work the field have them. They're required to turn them on. There's no, no ambiguity to that. And I, I, I hope that is spread across the country. It's a funding issue for a lot of uh, organizations, but I'm hoping that you know, we see that across the country. So Chief Davis, uh, I'm interested if you have any thoughts about either one of those, qualified immunity and, and, and body-worn cameras. But after you answer that, I want to I want to hear from you about the the relationship and working with district attorneys and working with the courts and having some say in who should or should not go to jail. But first and foremost, do you have any other thoughts that may not have been mentioned about either body worn cameras or qualified immunity, sir? Well, with the body worn cameras, uh, just going back to the legislation that was just passed here, a couple major things. Uh, around body worn cameras. First of all, over the next course of the next five years, every police officer in the state of Illinois has to be wearing body worn cams, but that's the law. And uh, there are there also legislation about the usage of them that they have to be on. Uh, and there's actually criminal, there's criminal offense if you're found to be malicious and, and then found to have intentionally uh, tried to hide evidence, turn your camera off or something to that effect. Uh, uh, so, and then uh, as far as officers reviewing body cam footage, uh, that was also included in the legislation as well. And uh, initially, once again, because the, that coalition didn't want to discuss those, those issues, it was very bad. Uh, we were able to get some changes made to uh, the, the original wording that are very much workable. Uh, but you know, those, those are some, some great things. So um, with that, uh, that's all I have to say about it. I'm sorry. And what was the second part? The, the relationship with uh, between policing or police uh, district attorneys and the courts and who goes to jail, who does not. Do you have any thoughts on that, sir? Absolutely. So here in, in, in uh, Cook County, Chicago and the Chicagoland area is in Cook County, which is one of the largest counties in the country. Uh, we have an African-American female uh, as our state's attorney. And uh, when she came in, she, she is of the mindset of social justice. And, you know, when she first got elected, first African-American female to be the state's attorney here in Cook County, you know, just that alone had chiefs up in arms in Cook County. And uh, I was an advocate for her. I would get her in front of the audiences of the police chiefs. I'd be making sure that I spoke out on her behalf and she won overwhelmingly. Uh, and since she's been in office, she's made changes that are socially just. And uh, she made some mistakes not in the changes, but how she made the changes. And, and that's just kind of a learning curve that I hope that others would learn from as well. And that I knew, excuse me, while she implemented some of these changes, but our colleagues who are already of the mindset that, oh man, we got this black lady in here. She's gonna come in here doing all this black stuff. And you know, well, we gotta worry about her coming in and change, making all these black changes. And she comes in and makes these changes and they don't understand the context. Uh, uh, one thing I'll share, one example. Uh, she shared, she, she changed things as far as prosecuting people driving on certain types of sub suspended licenses. Uh, so in the state of Illinois, there's different levels. It could be for, for a DUI or something to that effect, but it can also be because 
uh, you fail the emissions test. You didn't get, you know, things, th th things that are financially based. And so those things that are financially based, uh, she did away with us being able to, she didn't change the law. She just said, we're not going to prosecute those things in Cook County because they're financially based. And most folks that they pertain to, well, all of them are mostly people who are a socioeconomic, at a certain socioeconomic level, but most of them are black folks. But in a law enforcement perspective that, you know what, so now we can't arrest, what are we supposed to just let people go? And so those are the fights that, that, that she had to fight as a black female state's attorney. And uh, for, for me as a black chief, I had to pull her to the side and say, hey, you know, I, I understand what you're doing, but let me tell you how it's being received. And it's not even, not even if, it, if it had been worded the way I thought it should be, they probably still wouldn't like it, but the public would not listen to those voices anymore. So working with them and deciding who goes to jail, um, it, it, it's different for those who want social justice to take place. Not everybody, people who have substance abuse problems. Another one was retail theft. She changed this, she's changed what they were gonna prosecute with people with retail theft. If somebody's got a substance abuse problem, then we need to get them help instead of sending them to jail. But oftentimes, but it's gotta be a, it's gotta be a, a, a it's gotta be a holistic process. You can't say that don't arrest them and then don't give them help because now they're right back in that cycle. So that's where we have to talk to our legislators to make sure that we're collaboratively working together. Because last year, about a year and a half ago, a group of white chiefs, all white chiefs in Cook County came together to give her a vote of no confidence when she made some of these changes. Not a single black chief stood up there with them, uh, which was very, it was a very powerful statement that, that none of us stood there with them, but that was the attack that she was getting. And so, you know, we, it's, it's difficult for us as black chiefs when we're in there because, yeah, I don't like some of the stuff she she, she may have done, but but I'm not going, you know, what stays in, at home, what happens at home stays at home type of mentality. And we have to learn how to, instead of bashing somebody to try to work with them and see if we can help them. Uh, Dr. Brackton, we also have an African-American uh, female district attorney here, Rachel Rollins uh, in the Commonwealth, well, in, in Suffolk County. And when Rachel was running for office, she cited a list of 15 offenses that she would not prosecute. And she said that she was not going to any longer um, send, frankly, uh, prosecute low level nonviolent offenders to jail. Six weeks after she won her race and became DA, she was approached by Rutgers University, Texas A&M and NYU. And they asked if they can do a study on what she was doing. And the report came out uh, six, five, six months ago. And what it said was that if you don't introduce low level nonviolent offenders to the criminal justice system, the likelihood that they would get involved with criminality was almost nil. Conversely, if you did put them, even if it was low level nonviolent, not crazy stuff in the criminal justice system, uh, the chances are that they may stay in criminality for a lot longer. What's your, what's your thoughts on that report now? So we're seeing that not only just in that report, there was some recent stuff that came out from um, Center for Policing Equity. There was a study that came out um, recently that even talked about um, what the demographics look like and who's most likely to be arrested to pay, based on what your department looks like um, as well. So I agree, but I think we need to take it one step further, right, of when we off ramp people. Diversion programs are often post arrest once you've already entered into a system. So although the prosecutor has control and they have that discretion at that level, the real power is never introducing them into the criminal legal system to start with. So authentic diversion is when you work with the prosecutors, um, and this is something we're doing in Charlottesville, we're not calling it a reimagining um, public safety. What we're doing is, is basing it that we need to get away from procedural policing and that we have to have procedural justice and restorative justice in policing. So move away from the typical ways in which we do things, understanding that even a very simple traffic ticket can have a compounding effect on communities. Um, can't afford the ticket, your license gets suspended, your insurance gets suspended, you can't drive your car. I mean, it really does. Kids can't get to school, you can't get to work, can't get medical care. Next thing you know, you're trying to, to get transportation to even grocery shop um, and to get things done like that. So um, I think if we start from the beginning, understanding um, and what we say that we want as those laws, 
if if we, we need to move away from the punitive way in which we've gone about the criminal legal system, right? We are all about making someone pay as long as they don't look like you, right? Make someone pay for the fact that they are um, involved or that they're, you know, there's no grace, there's no mercy um, whatsoever. So we are learning to off ramp that, guess what? If they're not prosecuting, we're not arresting, right? Let's just end that game right from the beginning. They're not prosecuting, we're not arresting. And you do get a lot of flack from your communities, um, particularly those people who will always be able to afford police protections. White privileged persons will always be able to afford police protections, so they want people prosecuted. They want you to introduce people into the, the criminal legal system. I'm all for work right from the beginning. There's groups called Fair and Just Prosecutions um, that work towards these things um, um, as well. But the, the key to it is, is that when communities have these chiefs and prosecutors who are willing to put themselves out there around not reform, but imagining for the first time how we could do this system correctly, the community has to step up and support them, right? You cannot allow them to be out there by themselves. Chief Glover cannot be out there by himself being that lone voice. Chief Mitchell uh, Davis and Chief um, Scott cannot be the voices out there by themselves. They need to be, they need to have a home team and a away team that supports them when they're really fighting and oftentimes spinning in the wind when these agencies don't look like them or the or the, the profession doesn't look like them. Uh, Chief Club, I'm gonna come to you in a second, but I just wanna uh, re recount uh, a conversation I had recently with a colleague, uh, Dr. Brackney, wherein we were talking about um, the criminal justice system. And what came up in this conversation is that the criminal justice system is broken, okay? And what I said was, I don't think the criminal justice system is necessarily broken, but if you go back four centuries, the criminal justice system was built to be punitive and punishing way back when. I mean, do you think that there's some utility in that, that uh, that, that is the way criminal justice has historically been put together and now we really need to have this, the pendulum swing from being punitive to rehabilitative? Right. And also, you know, justice for who, right? We call people justice served individuals. And then when they come back in community, we continue to have these barrier crimes that, allow, that don't allow them to have a, um, a healthy, thriving lifestyle, right? When you pay off your mortgage, we say you've paid your debt to society. But it, when you come out of incarceration, we don't seem to think that you've paid that, that full debt because we're still about a punitive community um, here um, in the United States. So I agree. But the only difference is, um, I don't use the words criminal justice system. It is a criminal legal system. There has never been justice in the current system that we have set up. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll go there with you. I know how about that. Go ahead, Chief Davis. Uh, Chief Glover, a, 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 a question from um, one of the viewers. Given the desire to reform criminal justice processes, to what extent do the panelists believe cash bail reform legislation have adversely impacted crime rates in communities. This appears to be a social justice area that has been promulgated by huh, some DAs across the country. What's your thoughts on, on the cash bail system, sir? Well, quite honestly, that hasn't affected us here in Arizona since we're very hasty in this state, to be quite candid. They're not going to have a lot of social justice type of uh, elements that, uh, that are going to actually pass through. And so we have not uh, really experienced that uh, out here, but I could see that, you know, in, in terms of how that could probably be, um, you know, sort of problematic, depending on, on what you're looking at. And as we're talking about, you know, reform and rehabilitation, um, you know, we have to figure out what's the balance, you know, what is the bridge program to get people where they need to go? Uh, that's what's missing is that, you know, we, we're, we're looking at, uh, different ways of trying to reshape things, but we are probably missing the ball somewhere in between the delivery where when the person is, is you know, dealing with those circumstances, um, they're, you know, they're trying to figure out a way of being able to uh, resolve their issue. Um, but where is this sort of the bridge that, that helps them get there uh, without there being the punitive nature that we typically have in, 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 in this society? Uh, everything is about uh, as Dr. Brackney said, it's about, you know, you got to pay that debt. 
And it, you know, there's uh, there's a lack of of of, uh, of necessary programs that get us to where we need to go to make sure that we're, we're going to be able to allow people to just be able to survive and thrive uh, in this society right now. So as we come into the home stretch, and God, I have no idea why I keep using these sports analogies, but it's just hitting me out of the blue. Um, I'm going to go to you with the question, uh, uh, Chief Davis, uh, from one of our viewers, and then I'm going to give you each a moment to uh, basically sum up your thoughts, you know, on this discussion around public trust uh, and law enforcement and use of force. Uh, and I'm going to begin with you, Chief Scott, but uh, Chief Davis, I have, a I have something here that says, um, put humanity back in policing, put humanity back in policing. What comes to mind when you hear that, sir? Well, I change that a little bit and say I take I take the back out and say put humanity in policing. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess it depends on where you live and it, it depends on what you look like. That that has a lot to do with your experience uh, as far as as far as humanity is concerned with law enforcement, and that's where the equity that I talk about comes into play. That you know, if you can't. Be, be equitably empathize with folks. You got to be able to empathize and, and want to understand those in which you're serving, not policing, but the, you know you, those that you are serving. That's everybody, even those that you arrest. And if you can't empathize with them, that's where the humanity is, and 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 that's where that paradigm shift needs to happen uh, in our in our culture. And and we can put all the legislation in place. We can, uh, you know, we can change all the rules and regulations. But if we don't aggressively attack the culture, then this is going to be all for naught. And and right now, I think uh, Dr. Brackney mentioned it early on about uh, this this time. And I know Chief Scott said something about you know just kind of being blessed to be during this time. All of us in the, on this panel are blessed to be in the positions that we are right now. And, and you know, being the first black president of the Illinois Chiefs Association in the 80 year history, it was no coincidence. I'm a man of faith and it was no coincidence that I am the president during this time, during that legislation, when I was that voice, when it started off, I was the vice president, but as it went through, I became the president. That was no coincidence. And, and with that, I believe is responsibility. It is our responsibilities of, of those folks who are where are we've been blessed to get where we are in our careers and we have a voice to, to bring that humanity to policing for all people and insist that those that we lead have empathy and understanding and want to help those that we serve. Thank you, sir. Chief Scott, your final thoughts on public trust and law enforcement use of force. Balance. You know, I'm all for social justice in all, in all of its forms. You know, on the other side of that equation, the balance of the tasks in front of us as police chiefs to keep our community safe, not, not just in reducing and preventing crime, but also safe from bad policing. Um, there has to be balance in this conversation. And sometimes that is not in this conversation. For instance, to give you an example, I'm going to be quick on this. I look at my violent crime, our shootings here in San Francisco. We, we did a lot of research. We're working with a nonprofit agency trying to figure out a better way to do it, to, to, to reduce shootings and gun-related homicides. Here's our reality. The last three years, almost 80, almost 90% of our, our, our offenders, our shooters, and our victims have been in the criminal justice system, have been incarcerated on average 13 to 18 times before they either shoot or get shot. Something is wrong with that picture in my, in my opinion. So I'm for social justice and criminal justice reform, but we have to also be for accountability. I just had a 16 year old girl shot on Friday night and killed, standing in her community in front of her apartment building, minding her own business. One thing I can guarantee you is the person that pulled the trigger has probably been in jail 13 to 15 times because that's the average profile of our, of our shooters. So we have to get this right in terms of the balance between social justice, uh, equity in how we police, but we also have to have accountability, not only in ourselves, but we have to have accountability in our communities as well. Because the bottom line is we as police professionals cannot do this without the people that we serve being a part of 
what we do in a real way. And that's where the trust comes in because they are not going to be a part of what we do if the trust is not there. And so I know uh, we have some very, very talented people on this panel. We all kind of have to play by different rules in different states, but I think probably we all have that in common, that we want to get this right. We have an opportunity to do so because we are in leadership positions and we are blessed to be here. And before our time is done, I hope we can make some movement toward getting to that type of policing that we all aspire to have in our, in our, in our department. So thank you. Thank you for having this conversation. Thank you, sir. Chief Glover, final thoughts, sir. Yeah. So, um, you know, what uh, Chief Scott was, was talking about in terms of balance, that is definitely necessary. I mean, we do have to find the balance in, in all of this, but at the same time, uh, we know that, you know, there's, you know, equity issues uh, that are out there and we have to be mindful of that. And that's why we have to be very intentional on how we create our policies, uh, how we, you know, police with, with, with our purpose and, and getting back to just the mission of what it is in, in policing, why we got here in the, in the first place. Um, it's a blessing and an honor uh, to be on this panel. So, and it's definitely a blessing to be leading my department at, the, at this time in history. Um, my department has never had a black chief in 125 years until I came around. And so, you know, it, it is very much a blessing for me to be in this seat that I'm here today. Um, and, but it's, it all comes back to just knowing what your purpose is and, and trying to figure out exactly what's the best way of being a good customer service agent and ensuring that your people are carrying on that same culture. Um, as we know, you know, that, that, you know, that the, the whole uh, issue of, of culture and, and, the, and, and allowing for bad actors within your agencies um, is something that, that cripples law enforcement and you, and you got to get rid of them. I mean, you know, we, we all hear the, the bad apple spoils the bunch. Well, I mean, it completely bottoms out the barrel, you know, and so you have to, you have to be able to address those issues. Um, you know, as, as, as they come up and because it, it's, it's killing our, our profession right now. And so i um, very proud to, to be here, very, very proud to be a part of this uh, talented uh, panel. And, uh, you know, just uh, thank you so much, Noble family, for having me. Thank you, sir. Chief Davis, final thoughts, please. Yes, sir. Um, once again, uh, I think my colleagues have already said it all, is finding that balance. Uh, making sure that we are equitably, equitably uh, serving the people that we have in our communities and getting them involved. And I think uh, the doctor mentioned it earlier that we need to be engaging our citizens to ask, how do you want to be police? This is, you know, what do you want to see? They, it's not that they don't want us there. They want us there in the right way. And instead of us telling them what the right way is, we need to ask them what the right way is and partner with them. And we are, we be, we can, we're the technical experts. What do you want to see? And let's sit down and we can tell you how we can get there collectively. So now they got ownership in the process. So, you know, I think that, that we all can do that. You know, it's just an honor. Once again, I mentioned it before, I, you know, I know you guys are not just my colleagues, but you're my friends as well. And it's always great to, to be with you. And uh, we lean on one another. I'm going, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. And we're going to keep on moving it to the top. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you so very much, sir. Now, this comment is going to get me in trouble with my, my brothers in the struggle. But Dr. Brackney, we began with the best, ma'am, and we're going to end with the best tonight. Your thoughts, ma'am? You know what? I'm going to let you be OK with that. All right. Um, you know what? I'm just excited that here we are at almost 10 o'clock on the East Coast. And we've had very few of anybody drop off the, the attendees or panel discussions. That tells me how important this topic of legitimacy and trust is for this community, for black leaders and for black community. And every day, I mean, when I heard, um, you know, uh, I think it was Chief Scott that just said, we need to get this right. We need to get this right. Every day I come into this office, I am blessed, but I'm not only just blessed, I think about it with a certain scripture and it's Psalm 78, 72. And it says, and David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. So he had integrity of heart and skills at the exact same time. So that tells us what the community wants from us. They want that empathy, they want that heart, but they want us to do it right and to get it right. And if we wanna build trust, we wanna build legitimacy, um, we have to do this work with integrity of heart. We have to define the work that we are gonna do. And then we have to hold our profession and ourselves accountable when we fall short. Um, and I believe it, you know, we were all built for a time 
just as this. Um, so as in Charlottesville, as for me and my house, we will make sure it gets done. So thank I you. It. I love it. So as we close this out, I just want to thank Noble presently, but I also want to thank the men in wisdom that had the foresight to put Noble together, to put us in these seats, to fight in the cause for justice and equity and learning and compassion. 400 years ago, whatever side you want to take it, this government was created by the people, for the people, no, by the people, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we are the people. We are looked at by our, 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 our constituents to basically keep them safe and out of harm's way, to keep their families and their communities thriving. So as I've done this before, in the words of that gifted brother, Don Cornelius, peace, love, and soul. Good night, all. Thank you so very much. Really appreciate being here. Y'all take care. Thanks, everybody. All right now. Thank you. Thank you.